Kelly. I am a professor of philosophy of education in, at the University of Toronto in Canada. I am originally in the I left the island 42 years ago, but I come and go on consulting. And, and I happen to be the chair of the 3CL board. Okay. Now, um, this session is on government, post-truth, and architectures of social disinformation. We have uh, three speakers, uh, Maria, and Cedric, and Chiara. Maria based in Malta, Cedric French based in uh, England, and Chiara in Italy, and Vivian will respond for a reflection, and then we'll open up the conversation and discussion. So, then I have three brief points I would like to make as I reflect on what I have been hearing throughout, throughout, throughout the day. One is about the concept of government. Uh, I think we need to be clear that governance is not only in so-called parliaments and, and, uh, and with political parties. That too. But there is a lot of governance and policy making that governs our behavior or lack thereof in many organizations, <coughs> whether they are NGOs, or whether they are universities or any other organizations. Um, and the issue that we have been discussing, so-called the post-truth, arises not only with governments, but it arises in many other institutions vis-a-vis -vis the issue of governments. After all, democracy is one form of governance, among others. I favor the one. But then, of course, we need to ask ourselves what form of democracy. That's my first point. The second point is about this matrix that we have been people, scholars, and speakers have been referring to. And, and yes, we are. We are in a quagmire. We are in a matrix. There is no doubt about that. But with all due respect, I sense an outright bias in favor of classical Anglo-Saxon liberalism coming from the 19th century, which led us to the neoliberal condition, which in itself is a new form of colonialism and a new form of imperialism. And hence, we are in this quagmire. Unless we grab the bull by its horns, I think we are simply spinning the wheels in Thing. The third point is about the academia. I have taught in four different Canadian universities since 1982. I have come to the conclusion at the end of my career, I'm 65, that I don't have any hope in academia. I have seen so much abuse and corruption and I did at least seven years of a top administration in two different universities in Canada, and I was a member of Senate in two different universities in Canada. This is not a cheap shot at Canada. <coughs> but, but I haven't given up on the intellectual part, and this is where I get more excited and an element of hope, especially when I see young people like the students who accepted our invitation, and tomorrow we will have the forum with them, uh, who are interested in these intellectual issues, and not simply because of the rigidity, the rigor mortis of the academy, but because I hope they are interested in changing the world for the better, and therefore they are activists. I consider myself to be an activist through my literary writing and other forms of writing, I also formed a union 38 years ago in Canada in a university. I am pro-Palestinian and I organize all sorts of clandestine activities within my own institution. There are ways how to subvert the system for ethical reasons. Okay? But I cannot say this outwardly in Canada very often because if I say that, I'm identified 
as an extremist. Okay? And my last point is that liberalism, with its all emphasis of rationalism and an empiricist, logical, positivist form of evidence only, is in itself the most fanatical form of ideology that can exist. It has existed for the last 200 years. And I ask rhetorically, what has it done for Africa? What has it done for Asia? What has it done for the indigenous populations? Maria, thank you. Well, hi, everybody. I was hoping that I was going to be able to use the clicker. I'm not going to. Um, so I'll just keep reaching over and, um, and moving slides from there. Can you hear me? No. Okay, before I go on to uh, add many images, to be honest, uh, not much text there. But before I start, I just want to focus. First of all, I am an academic activist. I cannot define myself as one or the other, and I use the term borderlands in the sense of those in-between messy spaces, and in a sense that problematize these hardcore borders. So I'm sort of starting from this place. Whilst I'm active on a number of political issues in Malta, um, including most more recently issues of pro-choice, most of my work is focused on asylum seekers and refugees. <laughs> you can hear me though, yeah? Sorry, yeah. So, um, so most of my work is focused specifically on asylum and refugees coming to Malta. Um, but also looking at where they're coming from and where they may or may not be moving to. Now, when... Which one? It was the one on the right, okay. Okay, well, so when Alex asked me to speak in this... Um, Something struck me when I started thinking about the term post-truth. I noticed that every time someone speaks about post-truth, they talk about Trump and Brexit. That's it. That's like everything about post-truth is about Trump and Brexit. Now, I have issues with the term post-truth as well for many different reasons, and I will pick up on just a few today. It's impossible to mention everything. Um, so... Most of what I want to say, I'm not going to say in reality. But this kind of reflects this imperialism that I think needs to be questioned in the first place. So the United States is not the center of the universe, and neither is the United Kingdom. Malta is. <laughs> I jest. But I, was, I am Maltese, and I was brought up with one dominant truth. I mean, there were many dominant truths, but there was one big one, and that was the church. And that was God. And I can remember the struggles I had. And when we talk about the church, I'm not just talking about the institution, but how that institution feeds into our lives, my life as a woman, and what it meant to be a good Catholic girl, um, to the food I eat and when I eat it, to the clothes that I wear, to the questions that I ask, um, and the degree to which I could speak unto truth. And my mom, bless her, she would really struggle with what she would define as facts, and I would define as an opinion. It's not the only dominant truth. Thank you, Kiara. I chose these three images um, that I think are very representative of truths or dominant truths in Malta. And I picked these ones specifically as well because of the flags and the symbolism and the emotion that each of these images portray. So for the non-Maltese, you have um, the church, that's a fester, that's something that brings people together, and there is a lot of joy. Not only joy, but there is a lot of joy and a sense of belonging. Then there's the Labour Party. If I put these in black and white, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between them, despite the fact that they are so very, very different and tribal in many, many ways. And the other one is the, the Nationalist Party. And if you don't form, fall into what, at least one of these, then there is a problem with you as being Maltese. This is part and parcel of Malteseness. 
So meet the Fokkers. They represent the circles of trust. And if you are falling outside, and that would be me, outside of this circle of trust, then you have a problem. Not just in, in the sense of how you are perceived, but also in terms of how you speak unto power. So that you have the hope, who knew that Pink Floyd would come <laughs> so handy today? You have, if you like, this holy trinity, the hegemony, that is not complete. Hegemony is never complete, and it has been fractured. For example, with the rainbow in Malta and LGBTIQ issues. There are other voices out there, but they fall outside of the circle of truth. So I've been working on refugee issues since 2003, so that's 16 years. And that was before social media and Facebook really had a space in Malta. So I'm looking at pre-social media here. I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna have, keep you busy. Um, we had a detention policy. We still have a de facto detention policy. It's not a written policy, but people are still being detained illegally in Malta today. But let's talk about before social media. So we had a, a detention policy that at one point just went on forever, then went on for 18 months, was eventually found to be a violation of human rights on two counts and evolved. But the voices uh, speaking unto truth, unto power, if you like, were almost silent in those days. We didn't belong in one of the circles. So I just wanted, this is my only text slide, I promise. I thought, let me use a little bit of um, literature specifically from the migration field and one concept which we call securitization. You hear it a lot, but what does it actually mean from a theoretical perspective? Well, the uh, securitization is a speech act. Let me read it out. So it's a construction of a threat. In other words, we're not saying there is a threat in the real sense, but there is a perceived threat. And the threat is on the state as we know it, the state. But when we're talking about the state, we are talking about our cultural and religious sphere, our identity, the labor market, forced migration, asylum seekers and refugees, black people, ergo terrorists, ergo Muslims, are a threat to life as we know it. And once you've, made, once you've captured this reality, it means you can move into a completely different realm, because if we're under threat, we can move outside of the norms that we normally take for granted. It's the politics of fear. And suddenly, it becomes okay to violate basic human rights. Now, all of this has been happening before the world of social media. It's not recent, and if we're looking at truths, we can go, I mean, the Greeks were talking about it, but this is relatively recent, but before social media. This is just one quote that I picked on from 2009. Um, it was the Minister of Home Affairs, and I'll, I'll read it out. Given Malta's small size, you cannot expect the government to release illegal immigrants into the streets, especially in light of increasing numbers. This would send the wrong message and spell disaster for the country. As a minister, I am responsible first and foremost for the protection of Maltese citizens. Now I could spend all day unpacking this statement, but I just want to pick on a couple of points. First of all, as this minister, well, he knew very, very well, he actually lectures in human rights. They're not illegal immigrants. They were asylum seekers, as per the Geneva Convention. In other words, they were exercising their right, a right that was acknowledged in Maltese law. So we can question fact here, or truth here. It's about interpretation. The second is that we could release them into the streets. Well, eventually, everyone left detention anyway, so these were all released into the streets, but life continued anyhow. And the third one, and this is important for me, is the protection of Maltese citizens, because here now we have a border. In other words, it is the citizens that need to be protected rather than the refugees. So we have a borderline. The people with access to rights is dictated by citizenship. 
by the nation state. And we know that, that's why we sell it. Citizenship, I mean. So we're back to these three. And who controls the dominant narrative? They're all waving flags, flags that create a sense of belonging. But my question is, go on, Kiara. What, what flag do the refugees get to wave? Who do they belong to? And then I keep on going. Okay, so there we went to uh, sort of 2000, I, I don't know exactly when it was, but at some point, Malta exploded online. So you have Facebook and Twitter as forums that are, and all the other news outlets posting on these forums, and suddenly, you know, everybody's, even my mum and dad are on Facebook. I think they were retired and they spent half their life on Facebook. And what's interesting about Malta, if we go to the next slide, is we literally bump into each other all the time and we cannot escape from each other. And just 10% of the Maltese population is not on Facebook. This is crazy when you think about it. So the discussions that used to take place in the village square or at the grocer, or in, not in school because we're not allowed, but um, it's all sort of transferred to social media. And that's a lot of voices. And that's a lot of opinions. And for the life of me, I can't remember. OK, I couldn't remember what was my next slide was. So we've used social media a lot in our activism. And in truth, there are times where it's been really successful. We've been able to mobilize people who are outside those circles of trust. And at times, we're able to bring people together. Now, I'm not saying that the nation is full of racists, although I do actually believe that we have a massive problem with racism in Malta, and we can talk about how we might describe or understand racism. But I do find that despite all the anger and all the fear, when we organize something like a vigil for people that have drowned, a lot of people respond. This was the first candlelight vigil we organized, and thousands came, which in Malta is a big deal. They were able to feel. It wasn't about the anger. Somebody had died in the sea, and they were able to respond with empathy. We've also received support from the media. People talk about the media, but we've, as, as activists, we've had support from the media. It's also a forum where we get a lot of hate, um, but there have been examples, including a joint editorial on one occasion where the three English language newspapers took a stand with us and spoke unto power outside of these circles of truth. But there is so much information out there, and we're all competing for this dominant narrative, or at least trying to get to, to break in, if you like, to the dominant narrative. In a world that is increasingly complex, when we're talking about asylum seekers and refugees, we're not just talking about the people that are risking their lives to get here. We're talking about what it means to be Maltese, what it means to be European, what it means to be a citizen, who should have access to rights, should everyone have access to rights. In a sense, they are the other that represent all the complexities and the unknowns, which is scary, that we're dealing with today. And as an activist, I find it incredibly challenging to be able to capture this complexity in making our arguments. If I look to reason, it gets us nowhere. We have all the evidence as an academic. I'm constantly conducting research, but the policymakers aren't interested in the research because they respond to the electorate, the citizens. It's very easy to simplify. If we can go back, the far right have gained traction, if you like, because they simplify and they feed off the fear. I find it very difficult to counteract this. I'm, th this is one of our biggest challenges. And the three main trinity of truth, if you like, and now we can go to the next one, they've all shifted to the right. The mo two main parties, in order not to lose their electorate, have responded to the fear. That is what they've done. And the church has been essentially silent. Essentially silent. Recently, they've made more of a... Okay. 
Now, one of the problems with the people that we have conversations with is, is these bubbles. My Facebook is actually quite pretty. I like it. But that's because I deleted most of the people that disagreed with me. That was a mistake. That was a mistake. I'm nearly done. Um, it means I have comfortable conversations when we should be having the uncomfortable conversation. These circles represent the circles of trust. And so we're back out on the outside again. And I think I only have... Okay, no, I, I wanted to include this. This was a meet in a meeting, I won't say who it was, but I had a meeting recently with somebody very high up in government, very high up. And he told us, on the local scene, you need us. But on the international scene, we need you. And I'm just going to put that out there. I thought this was really, really interesting. And he's right. Because in the local scene, we're not making any headway at all. People are dying. People are being detained illegally. And I would say the majority of people shrug their shoulders. And the rest of them say, well, I, I just can't handle this. Or I can do nothing. And so the circles continue to repeat themselves. Mm -hmm. I put this back up here just to, to remember again that we're living in complex times and we don't necessarily have the answers because we're working with a new reality. And many of the tools that we work with were developed for 19th century problems, but we're dealing with 21st century realities. So even, John, when you said democracy, I would not celebrate democracy because democracy is essentially exclusionary. Where does the non-citizen fit in to the democratic um, institutions as we know them today? Ultimately, political decisions are made according to votes and refugees do not get a vote. And so we're left with this. Now we can argue about truth and not truth, but people are dying in the Mediterranean. More than a thousand have died this year alone, just this year. One thousand people, one thousand human beings who are not humanized. And I think this is how it continues to happen. And I'll end here. Thank you. I don't need a PowerPoint. Um, hello, I'm Cedric. Um, I'm a lecturer in data science. Uh, it's a bit of a different topic. Um, and I'm going to talk about various things uh, that concern me um, and myself as well. Uh, so I'll start with that. So I, I lived in different countries. I lived in Switzerland. I, did, I mean, I'm French originally, and I lived in Switzerland for my PhD. I spent seven years there in Lugano, fantastic town and then moved to the UK and I've been living eight years in the UK. So later on, I will talk about my perception of Brexit, of course, even though Maria said that we shouldn't speak only about Brexit uh, when mentioning the post-truth. Um, no, because first of all, I would like to uh, come back on uh, some terminology. And I'm glad that Maria expressed uh, the difference between opinion and facts, uh, which we haven't seen this morning. And that's why I want to come back on this. So people have been saying that all facts are relative, and that is a misunderstanding because facts are real. And Wittgenstein tells us uh, that the world is a set of facts, and we should start from this axiom uh, and continue from there. And so facts cannot be wrong. Facts are real. Facts are the facts. Now we have opinions about them. So people might have different opinions, and we might disagree on our opinions about the facts or about the truth. The truth being an idea that we're seeking. Um, so I thought it was important to come back on this and that everybody agrees on these terms. Uh, now, what other philosophers tells us, for instance, um, uh, Karl Popper, in the Logics of Scientific Discovery, tells us about theories. And what is a theory? Well, a theory is a statement. And this statement has some particularities. For instance, it has to be able to, it has to be refutable. You have to be able to refute a theory. What does that mean? Well, it gives an example, which is there are no black swans. 
Okay, so that statement is true until we have seen a black swan. So we go around, we do our observations as scientists, we walk around the Earth and we look for swans, and they're white, they're white, they're white. As long as they're white, the statement, there are no black swans, is true. Until we see one black swan, we take a photo of it or something, or we make a drawing and we say, I have seen a black swan. So I can refute that statement, and that theory that was true becomes wrong. And now it's a scientific revolution because everything that was based on that theory is wrong and everything changes, right? Okay, so why am I talking about this? Because I think that in politics, the problem is that now there is no, uh, I mean, we're not talking about things that are refutable or even verifiable, right? People make claims. Uh, for instance, Boris Johnson during the campaign for Brexit made claims that were lies. How is that possible that a politician is allowed to lie and to make claims that are not verifiable? That he doesn't cite his sources, right? So we can't check if the, if, the, if the claim is right. We can't even refute it if it's wrong. I mean, so it's just a, ma a manipulation of the mind of the people. Um, so that concerns me because I live in the UK and I'm a Frenchman, so I'm obviously very concerned with Brexit. Uh, what do I think about it? Well, I'm very surprised that the man who created the lies is now a prime minister. That, he's be <laughs> that he has been found guilty in court of lying to the queen and that he is still prime minister. I don't understand why the people don't rebel against this, you know. Um, I don't understand why the people are not in the streets saying, I don't want to be governed by a man who lies. Uh, I don't want to be governed by a man who is found guilty and nothing happens. Um, so this is very concerning and this is the reality of today. Um, now, something more about Brexit. It's very interesting to see that Nigel Farage, who led the Leave campaign for Brexit, was also involved in the Trump campaign. So it's the same people that are, that are manipulating the mind of, of, uh, of uh, everybody, right? The same people, a small group of people. So I don't want to talk about conspiracies, etc. but how come these people are allowed to continue to work? How, how come they are allowed to speak publicly if they're, if they're telling lies all the time? I mean, there should be some ethics for politicians and they should have to respect it, and if they don't respect it, they shouldn't be allowed to talk publicly. Now, okay, now that I've said all of this, uh, why am I here? Uh, for something completely different or unrelated. Um, so I did some uh, studies with my students uh, in the data science class and we worked on global warming. Uh, now global warming is a topic that affects us all uh, for many reasons. Um, and well, the good thing, the happy thing is that we found a solution to global warming. Now how is that related to the post-truth, etc.? Well, nobody knows there is a solution. I'm very surprised about this. So activists are saying, are complaining about gas emissions, etc. Uh, they, are, they are demonstrating in the streets, but uh, they're not acting towards the solution. I mean, it first struck me uh, when I was in a conference and I realized all the climate scientists have been working on showing that global warming exists, right? We've been listening to this for 30 years. And people still think that the global warming doesn't exist. For instance, the United States president, right? So that's one problem is that there are people who think global warming does not exist. Then there are people who think that there is no solution to global warming. So we don't know what is the solution, okay? And then there are people who know there is a solution and they're happy, like me. Uh, <laughs> um, now, what is the solution? Well, actually, it's very simple. We've been using predictive models in order to understand what would happen in what-if situation. And the what-if situation is, what if we were increasing the forest coverage globally? So if we were increasing the forest coverage globally of 30%, we would reduce the global average temperature, right? So we need to plant trees, okay? We need to plant a trillion trees in order to absorb the greenhouse gases and to uh, uh, remove the effects of global warming. Global warming is becoming very alarming because there are uh, facts, like for instance, the fact that bacteria in the ocean are becoming smaller and there are many more of, the, of them, which is what I believe is the reaction of life to an extinction, right? We are living in an extinction period which happened many times in history before, I mean, in the, the history of Earth, right? Many species are disappearing. Uh, we, all, we, are, we hear about species disappearing all the time. We are concerned about the bees. We're concerned about 
penguins. I mean, there is a colony of penguins, the king penguins. There was a million individuals, and now there are 20,000, right? So this is very alarming, okay? Uh, we have a solution. So we can stop being depressed and thinking there is no future. So that's the good thing about it. We just have to plant trees. The problem is it's a trillion trees. What is a trillion? That is a lot, right? That is a thousand billion, a thousand, thousand million, okay? So what happens is that there are some campaigns. For instance, in the UK, there is the big climate fight back campaign. They're planning on planting one billion tree by 2050. Well, that's not enough. Uh, because every year there are 15 billion trees that are disappearing. Okay, we're going down of 15 billion trees per year. Okay, there were six trillion trees at the origin of humanity, and now there are three trillion trees. We've cut half of them, meaning that well, we've lost one lung. Okay, we're breathing with one lung. That is the problem. Of course, gas emissions have been rising exponentially since the industrial revolution, but that is not the main problem. The main problem is that we're missing trees. Okay, so what do I do about this now that I have this understanding? Well, first I communicate about it, which is what I'm doing now, because people have to know there is an answer. It is in the news, you can check. Uh, there is a paper in the science journal, there is a paper in Nature, and there are uh, newspaper articles on CNN and whatever over on the BBC as well. This has been communicated, but strangely, it's not yet in the mind of the people, okay? So we need to continue to talk about it. Uh, and it's an amazing realization for me to see that in, in the times of today, where we have technology, where we have the means to communicate information clearly and fast, that ideas still take a lot of time to get into the minds of people. That strikes me, uh, strikes me. Okay, so what else do I do? Well, I plant trees. I mean, that's, you know, what I can do myself. I can plant trees, you know, because it's not so hard to plant trees. You can crack an apple open, which I've done, and take a seed, put it into a pot, and after a few weeks, it will sprout, it will grow, and now I have a beautiful small apple tree in a pot, okay? Uh, you can go walk in the forest or in the parks and grab the seeds that you find, take them home, plant them in small pots, water them, talk to them, and eventually they will grow. Right? And once you will have too many trees, you'll have to plant them somewhere else, go into the nature and plant them, and you know, solve the, cl the climate crisis. Because it has to be a global effort. A trillion tree is a lot. If we consider that we would be a billion people active and able to plant trees, that is a thousand trees per person. Okay? So you can you imagine planting a thousand trees? That's a lot. That would mean three trees per day for a year. So it's actually doable, three trees per day. Right? How many did we plant last night? Ten? Seven? All right. So, so you did three for you? Well, I brought it. I brought it for you. But I mean, you can just go for a walk to get some seeds, right? Um, now the problem is space. So we can plant them in, in pots as individuals. Yeah, we can start producing trees and then they'll be there. Uh, but we need to plant them in the ground such that they grow bigger. Uh, so there is a problem of space. In Malta, for instance, you don't have much space where to plant trees, and that is problematic. You need vegetation to survive. Um, in the UK, uh, there isn't much space either, and there are already big forests. Uh, France and the rest of Europe is probably the same, but if you look at the map of the world, there is a, some place where there is a lot of space. It's the Sahara Desert. Now people say, oh, it's not possible to plant in the Sahara. Well, that's not true, because the Sahara has been going through cycles of uh, times where it's green and times where it's dry. Uh, for, I mean, through history. I mean, it's, it, it became a desert the first time, millions of years ago, but every 10,000 years, apparently, it becomes green, it becomes uh, uh, dry again. Um, also, the Sahara, uh, below the Sahara, is the biggest reserve of fresh water. So we have water there, we just need to drill wells, then irrigate, and there is too much sun, so we can create structures you know, we can create things. So we can create structures to hide the sun and control the sunlight. Trees will grow underneath. They will start a root system in the area, and these roots will extend beyond this structure. The, the roots of trees actually uh, act as pipe for water, so they would cool down the soil, enabling over vegetation to grow, and also keep the humidity in the ground instead of the, uh, the humidity going straight through the ground to these phreatic naps, 
the humidity will stay on the ground and enable vegetation to grow on the Sahara. And so we can start experimenting with this. I don't understand why it's not done yet. Um, right. I think this is all I had to say. Thank you. All right, I just want one more minute, okay? Because John made some points at the beginning and I thought, hmm, maybe I want to answer about them. Well, I'm doing it right now. So you said democracy, which type of democracy, okay? Well, I've been thinking the direct democracy because at the moment most of the countries live in a representative democracy and that is problematic because people don't feel represented. I don't feel represented. But I lived in a country which is different, it's Switzerland, and they have direct democracy. Whether it's well implemented or not, it's a matter of opinion. But, um, whoa! <laughs> uh, direct, democra direct democracy, I think, is the way forward. Also with focus groups, etc., for people to discuss and feel integrated in their country. Then you said, we live in the matrix, I disagree. I mean, you live in the matrix, I don't live in the matrix. I mean, I'm able to disconnect, I go for a swim, you know, I don't need my phone all the time. Uh, academia, no hope, what? I'm a lecturer, I can't let you say that. Of course I have many issues with universities, yes? But academia is also the way forward, and education as well. That is the answer to everything, that's it. <laughs> we can discuss after that the democratic way to do it, okay? But we need to end so far. Okay. Um, So when Alex called me and um, told me I have to talk about post-truth, I was a little bit scared because I'm a public prosecutor and my job is a, a little bit different and I have never heard this, uh, this word post-truth. So I asked myself, mm, which, are the con which is the connection between uh, post-truth and, and my job, which is the connection with the jurisdiction? And at the end, I discovered that, that there are a lot of uh, connection and there are a lot of uh, contact points between my job and between uh, post-truth. The first one is maybe um, the answer to the question that the, um, the woman this morning, the feminist, the activist one did. Um, what uh, the government can uh, do um, in front of the, um, the post-truth. And uh, the, we have not a solution. This is only an answer. Because the question is, uh, is there any crime? Is there any crime if uh, I am not honest? If um, I, I write um, fake news, uh, there is a, um, can, can you be charged for, for this? Um, which is the impact of post-truth uh, of fake news uh, on uh, our job, the job of public prosecutor, but also the job of the police. The, um, you have to know that uh, in our legal system uh, to um, pursue a criminal, um, to, to condemn him, the, there is a, a um, typicity of law. So you um, have to, to um, to, to commit a real crime to be uh, put to the prison. And there is not a proper crime relating with the fake news diffusion. Why not? Because there is not a legal priority, a good of primary and absolute value provided by the state. It's not true at all because there are some times um, when you, you can say uh, you face a crime. And when it, um, you can uh, talk of a crime, if it's going to cause a social unrest in the country or a danger to a person, if you're going to touch a constitutional right of a person. 
For example, um, we are in a, we should be um, in a um, free country. I can uh, say what I think. If I think that the, um, your jacket, I don't like your jacket, I, I can say it because <laughs> we are <Your> free. <laughs> yeah, it's my opinion. So in our legal system, I don't like your jacket too. <laughs> in our legal system, freedom of speech means the limit of the truth. Because I can say what I think, but sometimes what I think can um, entail the crime of defamation. If you are talking, uh, or if you are texting uh, on a wall um, publicly available, mm -hmm. uh, something who damage a person's reputation, you could be charged. But there are three limits. And if you respect these three limits, uh, you cannot be charged. Um, which are these limits? Public interest, continence, and truth. Why? Because if I'm talking of my neighbor that is cheating on his wife, maybe no one is interested in these, uh, in these things. If I'm, if, uh, I'm talking, uh, I don't want to say Trump because uh, we, <laughs> we uh, talk only of Trump. If I'm talking of uh, Obama or some, someone else uh, that uh, is interesting uh, for people, if uh, I say something that is uh, not so much uh, inconvenient that respect the limit of continents. And above all, if I'm saying the, uh, something that is uh, true, I respect the limits uh, that uh, are provided in our uh, legal system. Again, uh, I cannot be charged of um, defamation. So you, you know how much is important the limit of, uh, of truth. Now the question should be which, which truth? But uh, I think that another uh, interesting um, field is the, um, is the relationship between our job and public opinion. Because, you know, our job is a, a very delicate job. I try to catch criminals, to, to send them to the, to the prison. And um, our job, our investigation are covered by secret. So uh, sometimes, every day, I have journalists that knock to uh, my door and say, can we have some information about that uh, case? And uh, it's very hard to, to ensure that uh, our investigation um, are, are a secret for all the time until uh, the, the end of the, um, of the trial. But uh, um, sometimes uh, this, this uh, relationship is hard because um, the truth that is based on evidence, is based on clue and on evidence, and th that uh, we try to, um, to brought uh, at uh, the end of the investigation is different um, to the, the truth that is spread by newspaper, by social media. And I reported a um, real case that in which was involved uh, my colleague, a uh, public prosecutor, a uh, young public prosecutor, and she works in uh, Ragusa, that is a small town in Sicily, not far from Palermo where I work. It uh, was uh, three years ago, on the um, hot summer of um, 2016, and uh, um, an Indian man tried to kidnap a little girl of five years uh, on the sea front, seaside of um, Scogitti in Ragusa. The PM, the public prosecutor, does not validate the stop for the second time. This is the real uh, newspaper um, text. I, I um, attached the, the real, uh, the real uh, newspaper because it, there was an article also in English, so I didn't uh, translate, but it's the real one. And uh, um, before to, um, to, to understand the, the situation, I have to explain only two things, about, uh, two things about our legal system. You know that in Italy, but I think also in your country, there is a presumption of innocence. So you cannot be um, put, uh, you cannot be sent to, uh, to the prison until the end of the trial. You have to pass through all the step of, um, of the, um, the investigation before, then the trial, and only only at the end, you, if you are condemned, you can go, you can be uh, put into the prison. But there are two exceptions. The first one is uh, if the police arrived when you are committing the crime. So for example, uh, the police arrived, there is the um, dead man on the floor and you have the smoked gun in your hand. 
um, in that case, uh, police can uh, um, catch you and uh, carry you to the, to the jail. The second one is if police arrived a little bit later, the commission of a crime, but uh, yeah, there are some um, clues that you are um, committed uh, the crime and uh, uh, there is a flight risk. There is the risk that you can um, go away, for example, if you are homeless uh, or uh, you are not uh, of the country country where you, you, were, uh, you were found. So only in these two cases you can uh, be sent to the, to the jail uh, before the trial. But it's not true for all the crimes. If I'm stalling, stalling a pen, uh, it's not possible. There are only some crimes uh, and uh, you have to see the, the penalty of these crimes. So this is, I didn't translate, I tried to explain the code of our, um, an article of our code that that explain uh, the fermo that is the stop. And you can um, apply this, um, this statement on, only if um, the, the crime provides um, a penalty at a list of two years of imprisonment. So the crime you, um, commit, you committed have, has to um, prov provide at least two years in the minimum. The uh, crime we were talking about is uh, kidnapping, and this is the uh, Article 605 of our um, code that explains which is the penalty. The penalty for uh, someone who um, is a kidnapper is from six months until eight years. So the minimum is six months. So you understand that it's not possible to apply to stop this person before the trial because these crimes uh, has a penalty too low to, to allow this. But this is the, um, the, the information that the newspaper gave to everyone. This is the, the information on the news, English newspaper. This is the story. The Indian um, guy of 43 years, Ram Labuya, was investigated of, uh, for the kidnapping attempt of a girl of five years. Um, the Indian had been put in freedom after the latch operated by the police. This is the story. Taking advantage of a moment of distraction of the parents, the man had picked up and, uh, the girl and had fled. The parents had chased after, after snatching the little girl and so on. The, the, the police uh, captured him, but then ultimately released by the PM in waiting of the validation of the catch. The decision of the PM had sparked the reaction on social networks and on the part of many citizens who, frightened by the episode, that they lost it by calling 112. The case is also finished in a parliamentary question of Senator uh, uh, Gaspari, who asked the Minister of Justice. So it was very, uh, uh, it a very huge resonance, this, uh, this case. A case in which uh, my colleague tried only to apply the law. And uh, after the, 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 the decision of police to catch him, she decided to release him because she cannot keep him to the prison. So this is the, 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 the truth. The prosecutor of Ragusa explains to act according to the penal code for the crime of attempted kidnapping is not expected to stop. By the confirmation of the firm, they may, uh, may be on the loose, and so decided for the second time in a row. So she decided to, to leave him free only because she decided to apply the law, but uh, uh, it was not understood by a lot of people and by social media, and uh, the reaction was very, very hard. Uh, she had a lot of uh, swear words, uh, insults uh, in uh, each social network, so people who said that she was not, she um, doesn't deserve to do this job, she was not able to, to do this job. So it's really hard to do uh, our job, and to, to try that uh, the, the, um, the situation um, can be understood outside and public opinion can, can say the real truth, the truth that is uh, based on evidence and on truth uh, of, um, that is another one. Thank you. Maximum seven minutes. <laughs>
maximum. I didn't say you have to do the maximum. Um, I don't think I'm going to spend the whole maximum. Okay. Uh, but yeah, we've been having interesting presentations uh, from my three other colleagues. Um, and uh, okay, I have questions for all, my, all the panelists. So uh, when it comes to Maria, right? I like when you, uh, in your presentation, you showed us the, the code of trust, the circle of trust, sorry, the circle of trust. And uh, if you don't belong into that circle of trust, it's sort of, uh, you are sort of like secluded from, from the bigger community, the society. So how do you make sure, uh, more so for the issue on refugees that you're very passionate and you made a really good presentation on, how do you make sure that the refugees' voices are included? Because, um, and based also on, on my presentation this morning, I think one way uh, to, reduce the, to increase trust is through engagement. And the moment that people feel secluded by the systems and they're not part of those systems, um, I mean, it just continued drifting the level of trust, um, and it's hard for it's hard for the people or the people who are in charge to trust the refugees and the refugees to trust the people who are in charge. And I was telling you about this story. Uh, we were just talking right, uh, briefly about Kenya, and I was telling you that right now I'm trying to lobby our government leaders to to allow free movement of refugees, but. Some of the people I'm talking to, they're asking me, oh, that refugee camp still exists? Mm. And these are government leaders. So they're, they're detached the reality of what's happening on the ground. So how do you expect them to even start addressing the issues of, of the people that need to be addressed? And then um, Cedric, you spoke about um, manipulation of the mind of the people. How um, can we uh, deconstruct decon um, that using data? And uh, I know it, it's a big question. How can we deconstruct that um, um, using data? And also to drive um, the notion on direct democracy. Hey. Okay, no, 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 we don't no. answer now. No, 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 no. Relax. She's not finished yet. You yeah. have another one to the other person? Uh, Kara? No, no, no. No, no. no. Yes. Okay. All right. We can go to Maria or we can go to the very passionate Saturday. <laughs> you decide. What do you want? You go, Maria. All right. Um, can't wait to do I mean, I used the those circles of trust, I was focusing specifically on and that, on that sort of holy trinity that I described in Malta, but obviously they are not the only circles of trust in Malta. I mean, it's much, much more complex than that. So if I look specifically at my work, um, first of all, I need to earn the trust of refugees, but I cannot homogenize refugees because they're all different groups and refugees don't trust each other. Mm -hmm. So you have different ethnic groups, you have gendered, you have LGBTIQ issues. Then there's a question of, well, who the hell am I, white middle-class academic, who is a citizen of the country to represent refugees? And, and even if I do, then what is the challenge vis-a-vis -vis recolonizing their voices? But if I don't speak, yeah. well, we're living in a yeah. democracy that even if it was a direct democracy would still fundamentally ex exclude their voices because they don't have a vote, which is why I can't agree with you on direct democracy either. They're not citizens. They don't get a vote, which is the fundamental point I was trying to make about democracy. I will let you, but after, after I finish. Um, so, so trust, my point is that trust becomes a, a massive issue. Mm -hmm. Now, and I used this sort of historical perspective as well in Malta to demonstrate that these issues of trust and even interpretation of the law and human rights violations have a history. They're not just related to this government, they're also the previous government, and even where we made accusations of violations of rights, they were excuse, uh, excused or ignored or justified according to, you, you sort of, you know, a lot of people will say, when it was in the nationalist government, oh, you must be misunderstanding, and then suddenly it's the Labour government and they're all out, 
on attack as well, or vice versa. Um, now, one of the only, it was funny, it was mentioned this morning, one of the only ways that we feel that we've made a difference was actually through using the law. Um, that's where we've had a few victories, um, most of them at the European level, which is also interesting vis-a-vis -vis you have more influence internationally. So what I wanted to do is sort of highlight the complexity of, of it all, but as things stand, asylum seekers and refugees do not have residency, they do, they do not have a vote, they're not citizens, and our democratic state is based fundamentally on this. Is it? I can talk now. I, I, I'm allowed. I want to converse a bit about democracy yeah. from another angle, I think. I, I, want, to start, I want to start with the... Yeah, let, let's hear I, can, well, I, I can't take like 15 more. questions. Uh, I mean, two questions. Uh, okay, first about the direct democracy idea. So, I mean, I leave it myself because I'm a French citizen in the UK. I don't have the right to vote either. You do in local elections. You're an EU citizen. I do, and I have but not in referendums, for instance, for the Brexit. You're right. Which so was that's very, problematic. Was very which frustrating. Was but, but very yeah, frustrating because you live, you. you live there and you can't vote. Okay. And I understand how they feel, right? right. Yes. Now, Cetera. direct democracy no, 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 is not second, necessarily... Second. Wait, let me answer. <laughs> let me answer. Let me answer. <laughs> no, no. Direct democracy. Direct citizen. democracy. Hold on, hold on. Wait, let me talk. Let me talk. On the form of citizen, I think this is crucial to your question. Hold on, hold on. He knows me, I can do this. And that is, <laughs> the problem here is, this is in your defense. Oh. The problem is, <laughs> I was the notion of citizenry, as we have it today, yes. created <laughs> by liberal yes. Anglo-Saxon. Yes. This is the problem. Yes. If we construct a different notion of citizenry, then, then we might which be able is to have where my hope mm -hmm. is, then, of course, we can envisage democracy in a completely different way. But not direct democracy as no, we know it today. No, and also I want to add that democracy is not only a form of governance, but a way of life. What you're doing is part of the direct democracy, not of as governance, process. but as a human being. Qua human being, you see what I mean? And if we remove and substitute the liberal individualist notion of of the citizen, then we are in better shape to deal with these things. We may not solve it, but we are in better shape. You see, so this is, I'm trying to bridge. No, All right. continue. To Sorry. continue I'll about direct democracy, yeah. I said it's not necessarily the system that is in place in Switzerland that, that is the answer, right? But the idea of direct democracy is that everybody participates, or we could say participatory democracy or something <laughs> like that. And what I wanted to say is they might not be citizens, but they can talk. Right? They can talk. They can talk to each and other. They, talk to they can talk. The cows come they home. can. They can talk to citizens. Uh, I mean, talking also transforms the ideas of others, etc. And I think it's it's by talking that that we can change the system. And what I would like as a democracy is a democracy where everybody feels integrated and everybody feels part of the nation. Right? And. That's what I was saying by saying setting up focus groups in which people talk about their issues, like, the, like you would do in a council in a village. So I don't know how to find a way to put that in place, and also that is not my field at all. So, um, all right, but that's what, I was, uh, that's what I had to say. So I think the direct democracy with uh, talk. Now, regarding the question of Vivian uh, about the manipulation of minds and what could we do with data about it, well, first of all, uh, we could check the facts that are, I mean the facts, the opinions that are uh, given by these politicians to manipulate the minds. We could check in the data to see whether they're correct or not uh, and communicate about this. That's the first thing we can do is use the data to uh, um, contradict the claims. Um, now, something else that I thought about the other day, the sound is really weird here. Um, uh, I was in a different conference and there was someone uh, talking about human rights and human rights and artificial intelligence. And um, she mostly looked at the risks of artificial intelligence to humans. But I had an idea. I thought, can't we use artificial intelligence to support people who are uh, defending the human rights? And I thought about concepts like human uh, mutilations that happen in many places, or you could think about refugees as well. Um, 
or just changing the minds of the people. So I thought, well, we could have chatbots, you know, AI chatbots that are programmed in order to go speak with the people that have been man manipulated to tell them, look, I mean, your perception has been controlled by someone and uh, here is the actual truth. Um, and prepare these chatbots such that they have a set of predefined answers to answer the concerns of the person and try to modify their minds. So what I'm seeing is in the future, probably there will be kind of mind wars uh, in between the people who are trying to defend the truth and the people who are trying to manipulate the population. And this will go through data and obviously artificial intelligence will be involved, etc. cetera. Um, these are scary ut utopia, um, but that is how I see that. Thank you, Cedric. Now, um, before I open up, a possible question for, for, for Chiara, but I also want to say in passing, Speaking will help, but speaking is not enough, you know. I have been speaking in Canadian universities since 1982. The arguments I make in senates as associate dean, as this, the other. I'm sorry, shit, they don't listen, you know. I have to act subversively to bring about some change. I, I'm, I'm fed up, I'm 65. How much talk are we going to do? And, and this is the, I'm sorry to say, this is what liberalism makes us believe, that in dialogue we can change. Yes, dialogue is okay, but it's not enough. Okay, now, Chiara, the law, which I think is very important, okay? Um, uh, you provide us, for me, a very interesting case. Interesting because it connects to my being. This is what interesting means, okay? Interest not like my Canadian British friends use it. They don't understand something they send me, John, it's interesting, uh, hold on. Or they disagree and they're afraid to say I disagree and say, oh, interesting, John. Oh, so, okay, look, tell me, you disagree, let's talk. Okay, all right, it doesn't matter, we're still friends. Okay, so, interesting case. Because I get the sense, I may be wrong, that, that the judge is caught in between here, right? The law says this, but ethically, was the law appropriate? And this gets us back to now the whole issue of values, which I don't think it can be resolved with evidence of empirical kind. We're into a matter of values. What's your sense? I mean, maybe you don't want to express yourself in public, but do you think this law is ethical, or should someone, as the person in this case, not be allowed to, to remain free because the law is not ethical. You understand what I'm saying? It, it is delicate. If you don't want to reply, don't reply, since you are a lawyer yourself. But the, the point uh, um, is connecting to the other uh, presentation that the, um, the reaction of um, media or public opinion yeah. is related to the, the fact that he was a refugee, he was an Indian, uh, an Indian yeah. man. Oh. So there is a, a, a passage of a, maybe. So it's a matter of constructing the accused person. Mm, maybe, okay, this one. The Indian without a permit with the, with the criminal record for drugs. This is the description of this man, and maybe the, um, the a person who read the newspaper only with these elements uh, can uh, believe that he deserves to be put into the jail. I so well, the law does not. Allow yeah, yeah, but. Is it Italian uh, law or is it European? European. Yeah, this I think it's the same. This is the same. <laughs> Italian law has to be consistent with European law. Uh -huh. um, so so the, this is the, the, the reaction was related to the to I this understand element. your point, but fair enough. Thank you, Chiara. So okay. it's, it's very delicate for that us to delicate. do our job yes, and, and to, to remember that we are all uh, <laughs> the same in front of the law. Of course, of course. Of course. But, but there is, of course, there is also the question maybe some laws need to be changed, and that is a broad question, of course. All right, so let me take, and <laughs> the uh, panelists can make notes. One, two, three, four, yes? Uh, can I use the mic? Sorry, yes, yes, I can use the mic. 
<laughs> although his name is not Mike. Okay, there. One, two, three, four, five. And then we'll take another round here. Be as concise as you can to give time to, to as many people. Sorry. Yes? Mike. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you for your respective interventions. They were all very interesting, coming from your respective backgrounds. Um, to present myself, I am Nestor Lavera. I work in Darmalta, and the permanent representation of Malta, and I participate in discussions on fake news and disinformation within the council member states, and I also follow commission discussions on that area. Now, with reference to the panel title, which is Governments Post-Truth Architectures and Social Disinformation, um, this is a debate that's very active on a European level amongst member states. Um, but um, obviously, given that it's its nature, we're talking about uh, information and even sometimes political discourse, uh, Europe is adopting an approach whereby it does not deal into the merits of what is truth and what isn't, because that is a very subjective concept. Rather, it's looking at fake news and disinformation from the way it is amplified and how it moves through digital sphere, for example, um, the way it's um, spread through Twitter and uh, what the source is and what its intent is. For example, if there's a particular piece of news um, which is being circulated through verifiably um, proven Twitter bot networks linked to uh, Russian interests, for example, with a clear intent to possibly disrupt a particular electoral process, either in a single member state or in the overall European Parliament elections as recently um, took place, that is clearly classifiable as disinformation. Now, um, recently in France, uh, November of last year, a law was passed aiming to tackle fake news. Um, again, on these clear identifiable criteria of, of intent and how it spreads. Now, given your respective backgrounds uh, in, in, uh, in uh, civil rights, um, c activism, climate change activism, from a juridical perspective, um, what do you envisage to be the roles of governments and public institutions when it comes to tackling fake news, disinformation, and how it spreads? Thank you. Uh, I'm Ketan. I'm a PhD student at the University of Malta. Uh, I happen to be an Indian with no connection to the kidnapper. <laughs> uh, so uh, my question was to Maria, um, especially with, um, when you talk about trust. So I'm generally studying quite a bit, researching quite a bit with trust literature, and they tend to mention that uh, the way to increase trust is to uh, increase risk, uh, in the sense that increase awareness of risk. It's only when someone takes a risk that they need to trust. Uh, in that sense, I'm sure that the news media and social media can be used to create both an awareness of the risk, as well as uh, perhaps try to manipulate people into thinking that there is no risk that they need to take. What are your thoughts on that? Just wanted to hear your thoughts. Uh, thank you, Halifon uh, from the University of Malta. Uh, my question is to Cedric, uh, and uh, Joe can also reflect on that. My question is on the uh, issue of direct democracy. Uh, so you said, Cedric said, uh, the best way forward is direct democracy. My question is, uh, Brexit is the best way how direct democracy can be exercised. The British people uh, directly vote on the fate of their country. Do you think this is the best way forward? Because I'm asking this, I can observe some kind of uh, contradiction on your observation because you, you don't like the result of uh, Brexit, but you support that should be the system forward. He said my name, so <laughs> I am from the University of Toronto. So I have a couple of questions and comments. First, I wanted to thank Maria for bringing up neoliberalism because all day we've been going on pretending like this, these issues have no, it has no class uh, um, root. There are no, no issues with class or the economics or capitalism at all. We're beating around the bush not talking about neoliberalism. So, so thank you so much for that. 
Second, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the notion of citizenship that uh, you brought up. So we're, right now we're dealing, as you know, with a, a humanitarian crisis uh, with the refugees and with Turkey attacking the Kurds, it's only going to get worse. So, and you're talking about the notion of citizenship, which in my mind is in direct relationship with nation states. Nation states and these man-made, made up uh, constructs. So citizenship in that, um, in that, um, no, uh, in that, in a with, with a relationship to nation states is an oppressive term to me, uh, because it takes away uh, many people's rights. And also, last point, I promise, it's about what uh, Cedric was talking about. I was going to ask you about you know trees and everything, but you brought up the notion of voices. Uh, no, not everybody has a voice, even as a citizen. You are, and you know, me and many of us are speaking from a position of utmost privilege, and many, many people, even as citizens, do not have that privilege. They don't have that voice. So I had both a question and uh, yeah. save it. Uh, Nadal Kabar, I'm a student at MCAST, I'm a journalism student. So basically I want to say um, about the circles of trust. Um, personally, I don't fit into any of the circles basically because I'm Muslim, I'm half Libyan. So basically, whenever I try to talk in debate, uh, yeah, I'm Muslim. Whenever I try and talk, even as a citizen who was born here, whenever I try and debate uh, people about immigration, or anything, I get called, you know, ra racist terms. Uh, so I find it very weird that, you know, we consider citizens as having some kind of uh, platform when even as me as a citizen, I, my voice is squashed. So uh, also about, I was gonna say, about neoliberalism. Um, for the past 10 years, basically, neoliberals have said uh, austerity is a measure that is good for the population and so on. And basically all it has done is cause poor people to go towards populism especially in the UK and in France and in Italy. And neoliberals keep repeating on the same thing. Even, for example, this week, uh, where uh, Ellen wa went to, uh, I think, a baseball match with George Bush. And uh, she posted about it. And the comments, there are a bunch of uh, people who are saying, oh, this is good because you're reaching out to the other side, and so on. And I find it very insulting because George Bush, you know, inv illegally invaded Iraq and killed, uh, you know, one and a half million people. And people try and say, uh, are you reaching out to those sides? Or, you know, the left doesn't uh, want to compromise with the right because they don't want to talk. But it's pointless to talk with individuals who refuse to even acknowledge your existence. Thank you very much. Thank you for your honesty. All of you. Okay, so, not any further. Anybody can comment. Um, because uh, I, uh, there was a number of points that sort of touched on what I said. Um, what, is, what is the government role in tackling fake news and how it spreads? So m my perspective, uh, I have an issue because when I'm talking about fake news, I'm talking about governments predominantly. Um, and, and we could have a very, very long conversation uh, about this. But I used that quote as one example of how... Um, Members of Parliament from both sides have, I mean, today we say fake news. In the past, it was giving it a spin, which is essentially the, the same thing. You can interpret many different things in different ways and, and use language to justify your perspective. But when you're in government and you're doing that and you're influencing not just the electorate but people's lives, I have a real problem with it. Now, in terms of the European Commission, this is where it becomes complex because, yes, the European Commission has a strong role and has spoken out quite strongly on refugee issues as well. But ultimately, the decisions are being made by the Council of Ministers. The policies are being decided by the member states. So even if we look at Luxembourg two days ago, back to square one again, and I don't think any of us uh, are surprised. So these are the challenges that, that we have to deal with. Um, the question on trust is, is a tough one 
for me. Um, there are two things that I'm dealing with at the moment, sort of in my head, you know, the sort of that praxis process. One is trust, the other one is hope um, for, for, for different re reasons. Refugees need to trust us um, as, as activists, but at the same time, why should they? And who the hell, you know, I mean, you know, so, but at the same time, they have, in a sense, everything to lose, but nothing to lose because of the situation that they're in. So um, I don't have any answers, just a huge awareness, um, if nothing else, of when I say, you know, we speak and we do speak on their behalf, but knowingly. Um, and so there is always a risk and to capture all of those voices and all of that complexity is, is, um, is, is something that I, I carry with, with, with full awareness and make many, many mistakes, you know, and will continue to make mistakes. Um, but obviously on a human level, I think we gain trust through just sitting and being and listening. Um, it is ultimately relational and, and that's one of the problems with social media is, is that you don't have that, that connection at the end of the day. And there's nothing quite like smoking a cigarette and having a coffee and, and, and just getting to know the other. I should stop the smoking but the coffee, but you know, I can't get rid of both of them. Um, impossible. There is a humanitarian. Well, I should go heading up that way. Um, but even the law can change. Um, humanitarian crisis, yes, but ultimately a political crisis um, that is creating. Who said that about the? It was you, wasn't it? Um, in in Turkey, mm -hmm. and the humanitarian crisis in terms of refugees globally. But this humanitarian crisis is also a result of political crisis. Um, they are constructed. People are being bombed in Turkey or off Turkey right now, the Kurds, because of a political decision and because of an interpretation of a, of a particular context and certain egos. Um, but obviously when I'm talking about citizenship, yes, I'm specifically then linking it to the nation state. And I do think we are in, again, simplifying, but I think we're in the death throes of the nation state as we know it. Um, and when you when, when, when we die, we put up that last fight. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. Um, and in terms of the circles, that the notion of flag that I used was in direct relation to, to notions of Malteseness and, and what it means to be Maltese. As, as a woman, uh, as a Maltese woman with um, perhaps unorthodox perspectives and also with this accent, I'm always told I'm not Maltese. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I can relate um, on a level, and I think this is also evolving. Um, but again, there are death throes there. The notion of Maltese as being Catholic and straight and um, whatever is, is obviously under threat. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. But it's not going down without a fight. Thank you, Maria. Yeah. Yeah, no. Does that work? Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for your questions and comments. That was quite impressive. Um, I hope I can uh, a plus. bring some, yeah, A plus Sorry. on the questions, yes. Um, all right, regarding the, the role of governance, yeah. well, it's, I mean, everything is related. This microphone, can I have the uh, actual microphone what somewhere? Mean? Where is the microphone? What's this yeah, one? yeah, it's, it's, at, it's just weird. Distance, it's, 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 this one is just weird. Okay, so I think it's related. Um, what you asked about the role of governance and tackling fake news and what you said about voices of the people. Because um, I think it's the role of governance, it's the role of, our, of the people who govern us, governing, I don't like to be governed, but yeah, I think it's, it should be the role of governments and people in power to ensure that everybody has a voice. And I'm very saddened that people, some people have no voices or that the refugees have a hard time expressing how they feel or expressing their issues. Um, everybody should have a voice, wherever they are, whoever they are. And Vivian this morning spoke about global citizenship, and I want to feel like a global citizen as well, you know, because I lived in multiple countries and my passport means nothing to me anymore. And I don't want to take the British citizenship. I mean, I have the French one. What does it mean? I want a global passport. I want, yeah, I want to exist like anywhere, you know? And, and everybody should have a voice. So. We need to change our systems to ensure that people are represented and that people have a voice and that every voice is heard. Now, regarding fake news, yes, it should be. It should be the task of the government to say, look, we've put a team of people on this and this is fake and this is true. 
This is the truth about this, this is not. So is it the role of the government to control the truth? Certainly not, because otherwise we end up in Big Brother and 1984 books, you know? where people control the mind of, of uh, the population and control the uh, um, terms, etc. But it is certainly the role of the government to eventually say, well, look, this has been heard by too many people and this is wrong, this is fake news. We need to ensure that the people know the truth, right? And this is not, I mean, the role of the journalist, the role of the journalist is to express the truth when it's not expressed, is to say, I have an information here, and people need to know about it, okay? But the role of the government is to establish and to say, well, here is a problem. This information is wrong and, and people believe it's true. This is a problem. And I don't think it deals with it. I don't, I don't think it's about uh, journalism. Now the question about direct democracy and the contradiction in, within myself. <laughs> well. I like the referendums, but I think the way the referendum uh, uh, happened about Brexit was really, really wrong because people were presented with wrong facts. People were presented with lies and they didn't really have the time to reflect. Um, so I think this was, you know, this should be, this should be canceled really because, you know, uh, wrong facts before. Uh, so I think it is important that uh, in in direct democracy that people are presented with the facts beforehand, you know, that everybody receives the same sheet of paper with the major facts that are verified beforehand, and that we vote based on our emotions, of course, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but with being presented with the real facts, right? And that was not the case for the, the referendum about Brexit. Um, so I think that's why, uh, have I answered everything I needed to? I think so, oh no, I want to make a comment as you said about George W. Bush, yes, it is a shame that uh, the United Nations uh, have no power anymore, and that's related to what happens in Turkey, and the question is, what, what are we gonna do? Thank you, Cedric. Um, Chiara, any, any reflections you um, want to add? I don't want to take position on uh, ethical or moral question because mm, I think they are very delicate and I have no skills to talk about them. But uh, I can say that um, an important role as the government, but we are not so related to the government as you think. When I read this morning um, Chiara Capulongo, Government of Italy, I remember the um, separation of powers and we are a jurisdiction that is totally different of the government. And at the end we have to apply the law, but the law is uh, made by parliament. So we have an important role, but we have a power that is limited by the someone else. So we can also hope, desire um, a decision of government on fake news, on statement about uh, penalty more severe, but we have no power in this direction. Thank you, Chiara. Very, very, very fair. Um, I have two, two brief things. One, it's a, it's a very brief observation, Maria, about, um, um, yes, I don't think there is any doubt the major political parties and the supporters act as if tribal, within quotes. Um, but I think the church is also tribal. It definitely was, and I think it still is, but, but that is. But, but this also reminds me, and, and I fall into this trap myself, okay? Um, tribes are usually associated with Africa. And, and, and we also then tend to think that tribes are bad, but, but this, this, I think, is an open issue. And the case of Libya, for me, has opened my eyes in terms of how I use the word. But, but this is, you know, I mean, can I you, can, you can respond, yes. Um, I'm from Sijiri, and yeah. um, how many Maltese are there in, in the room? How many people are from villages? I am from Dingley. What's the first thing you say when you meet someone from a village? Taminint. Yes. yes. Taminint. Who do you belong, do you belong to? to? Yes, that, that, that couldn't be more tribal. tribal yeah. and, and this, uh, you know, the, the, the point of tribes, I think, is, is really needs to be, it's like organizing an ethnic night. If I say we're gonna organize an ethnic night, it's like I'm gonna whip out the bongos, as if Malteseness is not associated with ethnicity. So what we're talking about is an exoticization of certain terms. Of course we're tribal. 
there are fluid there is fluidity within these tribes, but it's tribal, yes. like football teams, and um, it's tribal. Yeah, and my point is, I'm, I'm, I mean, there are problems with tribes, yes. but there are also good qualities with tribes. For example, in African states, we know. Um, from African scholars like Molefe Kate Asente, that before the colonizers came, the way tribes operated was in fact very participatory democracy. And, and, I and then liberalism in its, in its liberal democracy came and, 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 I would and, and refer yeah. to these people as being uncivilized because they have tribes. But and I, and I would problem. agree with you, but we, what I'm saying See, is we need to I mean, problematize uh, everything uh, yes, in, yeah. in the same way sure. that there are good things about I, I democracy understand. and I, bad I, things. I understand you, it. Though I was going to use an, another example, to be honest, but um, but it's the same as borders. I am very critical of borders, but borders protect of course, too. So of course. you know, I mean, it's not about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, that was one point. The other point was um, yes. Le 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 let me be upfront. The whole issue of racism, and I'm reflecting now more of my own situation in the country I have lived for the last 42 years, although I see a lot of it even in, in the EU, including Malta, okay? And that is, I mean, I, I reflect on the very nature of the policies themselves. Canada has a constitution which has limits to, to, to whatever one can say. And the major limit in the constitution is hate speech, okay? Hate speech. And I think it is fair enough. Even the classic John Stuart Mill agreed with some notion of censorship when it comes to hatred, all right? But the point is this. We had a case in Canada, one among many, the Keekstra case that happened in the 1980s in Alberta. He was a history teacher in grade eight, nine, and 10. In other words, secondary school, where he was teaching that the Holocaust never took place. And if students in their exams or in their essays wrote otherwise, they would fail, okay? You know how long it took in Canada, liberal democracy, to remove him from the schools? Any guesses? 14 years, 14 years, massive, massive evidence that he is trying to indoctrinate students, one parent after the other, one student after the other, and it took 14 years of fighting in the legal system. This is racism within the policy itself. That's one case. The other case is in the case of the province of Ontario. Seven years ago, we had a liberal government directed by McGuinty, okay? And an issue arose because some of us from where I teach, headed by my colleague from Ghana, George Sefadei, we should have in the public school system black-focused schools, not just for black students, but schools which are run on the notion of knowledge and values based on the communitarian African understanding of knowledge and the community. The government did not allow for this school to be established. Why? Because the government said, we don't have any research to show us that the school will work well. And here we get into the evidence game. It is a game. How are we going to provide evidence that such a school is of benefit if you will never allow us to establish one? You understand? And therefore, I come to the conclusion that there are so many cases, at least in the liberal democracy of Canada, where the policies itself that are considered to be liberal democratic are in their very nature racist and exclusionary. And this is why I come to the conclusion, among other analyses that I have written about, that liberalism is very problematic. So please, don't think I'm a fanatic without reasons. I'm giving you some reasons, okay? She asked me a question when we were talking about dialogue. Like, do you really believe dialogue does not? Okay. I truly believe there is a limit to dialogue. Why? Because dialogue means that the other side you are dialoguing with 
is genuine in his or her open inquiry. I have been caught many times in universities where the other side does not have the agenda to openly inquire, but to let you dialogue, and then they will use what you have said in order to stab you from your behind, okay? So, if I recognize now, even within the university, that the other person I'm dialoguing with is suspicious, I stop the dialogue. Because then it does not become a dialogue, it becomes a manipulation under the use of dialogue for their own purposes to get whatever they want to get. And that is not dialogue. You understand? Okay. No, there's time, so I speak a lot. <laughs> Any other quick question before I ask them the little phrase they want to end up with? <coughs> yes, please, please. A comment, yes, a comment is fine, yes, of course. Hi, my name is Anna. Um, and I, I wanted to latch on to a number of things, but I, I will also say on the off that I work for the European Parliament, so that's going to be a little bit my perspective here. First of all, I'm a little bit, bit concerned about certain things I've heard, not because I want to defend the establishment, but I think we should also keep on the forefront of our minds that the international community has lo worked long and hard to establish multilateralism which has not been directly mentioned here, but if we challenge certain concepts, we are also challenging that, and it is that which has led us to certain gains. And some of these gains are very important, and some of these gains we still need to work to defend. I will mention the UN Refugee Conven Convention. We are working to defend it. There was a time back when I was more active on this particular issue in the 90s where we were looking to push it forward. Now we, we stick to what we have and we try and keep it there. We had the US pulling out of the Paris Protocol and the Climate Change Convention. That is huge and that is scary. We are all responsible for all of this within our nation states as citizens and yes, sometimes we are powerless and sometimes we do not always have the right to vote depending on the situations we are in. But even in those situations, we are still responsible for protecting our rights and not shirking our duties. So I'm white, middle class, as Maria mentioned, and so on, I have a certain level of education, etc. I still lived racism in a country I lived in for a number of years. Um, when our country was not part of the European Union. So I was referred to as a sort of subspecies of humanity, which were these people outside the European Union. Of course, when I would point out that I was one such person, normally my interlocutor would pull up short and say, oh, but I don't mean you. Like, why not? You know, I am part of that problem. So um, the importance of human dignity to underscore all that we believe in, in our interactions with everybody, I think is, is something that should really underpin our work and our beliefs and our action. And again, a very big trend of action at the moment that we are working on, that you are working on, is climate change and preserving a planet for all of us to live in. Or otherwise, all of this is a bit of a moot point. Um, are your voices loud enough, Cedric? Have you been speaking to the people in power? Have you used politics as a force for good in this case? Thank you. Thank you for the panelists.